Welcome to Worship with the Universalist Unitarian Church in Peoria. My name is Reverend Jennifer Innes. It is my great joy to be serving with this congregation along with people of all ages and at all stages of life. Together, we strive to live into our mission of embracing freedom, loving inclusively, growing in mind, body, and spirit, and doing our part to add to the wholeness and the healing of the world. And in living that mission, we recognize the network of relationships of which we are a part. This is the ancestral home of the Peoria people. They assisted the your first European settlers as they came down the Illinois River. We honor the Peoria people every time we gather for worship for who they were and for who they are today. I want to thank everybody for joining us in person and online. I bet we have a patio crowd as well. There are so many ways in which we have a chance to gather together. It is something of an act of courage to seek connection in this and larger purpose in this age. So welcome, welcome all you brave and wonderful souls for joining us today. If you are new, please help us get to know you. Stay for visiting uh, for coffee hour on the patio or have a conversation in the Zoom after the service. And also, I want to add a note of thanks for masking while we're in the building and for turning your respective devices to worship mode. So I have a couple of words for what's coming up, for what's happening in our collective congregational life. Uh, first, next week is the first ever, as far as people have been telling me, the first ever blessing of the animals. So, yes, indeed, you are welcome to bring creature friends to church. Yes, so we will gather in Fellowship Hall uh, and please be sure that your respective animal friends are leashed or in an appropriate carrier. Um, and also, I want to invite that photos are welcome, if that works better for you. Um, and you are also welcome, we'll have a separate table, we'll, we'll, you're also welcome to bring uh, photos of beloved animals that uh, are deceased, are no longer with us in body. Please see me for any questions, including about species, because that's always an interesting conversation. I look forward to creating this moment together with all of us. The cast of thousands is the creatures of thousands. And now I have a couple of announcements about uh, staff. First, I want to welcome Jesse Lachlan as our new Director of Lifespan Religious Education. Jesse is here in the sanctuary. She officially started on August 1st. She's been doing so much to help the program for quite some time, I must say. Uh, we will also have a more formal welcome uh, in an upcoming service as part of our in-gathering. And for now, I just I have to say, I can't wait to see how our lifespan program will bloom and grow as we come with Jesse's leadership. Now, I also have another note about staff, and this is gonna be a work in progress, just so you know. Um, so Carol Manny has been doing a wonderful job as membership coordinator. Um, and at this point, she's going to be stepping down from that position. Uh, she's going to be shifting back over to teaching. And mostly, she's kind of looking forward to being a member of the congregation again. Uh, I am so grateful for her efforts on behalf of all of us and our larger purpose and to making this congregation a welcoming space for everybody there will be a chance to celebrate uh, Carol's good work for the past 10 months. We'll announce that a little bit later. Um, but if you have questions, I invite you to see our board president, Linda Fairbanks, or me, and we'll go forward from here. And now, let us turn to worship. I have the pleasure of welcoming our pulpit guest this morning, the Reverend Allison Farnham. Uh, Reverend Allison comes to us through her work with the Unitarian Universalist Prison Ministry in Illinois. She enjoys life with her spouse and two children in the Chicago area. And I'm so glad we have a guest in person today. This is excellent. Yay! And now I will turn over. We are going to turn to our first hymn, but I'm going to turn this over to Reverend Allison first. Amen. 
We mask because we care, and it creates awkward moments like that. Was released by Billy Taylor in 1963. And the song became part of the civil rights journey musically. So as we join in singing this hymn, I invite you to hold and respect the spirit of the song and also the experience that is called up when we sing about what it means to be free, particularly bringing into our hearts those who are currently incarcerated in Illinois jails and prisons. So with that, I invite you to rise and body your spirit and join in singing hymn number 151, I wish I knew how it would feel to be free. Now you are invited to call us all together in worship with a responsive call to worship. Your job is to, when I hold up my hands, you say, no one is outside the circle of love. Shall we try it? Ready? Wonderful. We know that hurt moves through the world perpetrated by action, inaction, and indifference. Our values call us to live in the reality of heartbreak in our world, remembering that is outside the circle of love. 
We who are Unitarian Universalists not only affirm the inherent worth and dignity of every person, we also affirm the inherent wholeness of every being, despite apparent brokenness. No one is outside the circle of love. We know that things break or break down. Promises, friendship, sobriety, hope, communication. This breaking happens because our human hearts and our very own institutions are frail and imperfect. We make mistakes. Life is messy. No one is outside the circle of love. With compassion as our guide, we seek the well-being of all people. We seek to dismantle systems of oppression that undermine our collective humanity. We believe that we're here to guide one another toward love. No one is outside the circle of love. No matter how fractured we are or once were, we can make whole people of ourselves. We are whole at our core because of the great, unnameable, sometimes inconceivable love in which we live. Amen. This morning, the chalice lighting words come to us from Deanna Van Diver. We light this chalice, symbol of our faith alive in this world, naming our vision of collective liberation and daring to remember each other into the beloved community. Now is our opportunity to open our hearts and minds to this story for all ages. It's a story called Missing Daddy, and it's written by Mariam Kaba and illustrated by Brie Royale. If you haven't heard of Mariam Kaba, she is an activist and an organizer who works for empowering young voices all over this country to work towards creating communities of accountability and wholeness all over. And so I share with you this story called Missing Daddy. It begins with a quote. Next slide. Each and every family is unique, from its people to its food to the words that we speak. Related or chosen, large or small, we can feel loved even when the world puts up a wall. Next slide. Daddy calls me Lightbug because I'm so pretty and bright. Since I don't see him very much, I hold on to his words real tight. Next. Daddy went away to prison when I was only three. When I asked my grandma why he's there, she says, baby, the reasons are many. Sometimes my classmates laugh and make fun. They say, you know, your daddy is a criminal, so that makes you one. Next page. I guess some kids forget that words can really hurt your feelings. Grandma says everyone should be kinder and choose words that are gentle and healing. 
I try to be brave and hold back my heavy tears. I feel a blue wave of sadness. My daddy won't be home for years. Mama works day and night. She's always on her feet. I miss her, but she says, baby, we got to eat. My teacher, Miss Lee, taught us that there are all kinds of families. Some kids only have a mommy or others have two daddies. Those who love us help us grow no matter who they are. They are our true family, whether near or far. I have an older sister named Mary who I never get to see. She lives with her mommy in a place called DC. I wish we could talk regularly because we share the same story. I want to tell her that I miss daddy, but I don't want her to worry. At school, I talked to the counselor, Ms. Parker. I guess it helps me feel a little bit better. She asks me a lot of questions about my daddy in prison. Sometimes I don't want to speak, so I talk about my ballet lesson. When visiting day is near, I can hardly sleep. I'm so excited. The happiness in my soul is deep. We travel to the prison. It is far, far away. Getting there takes grandma and me all day. Finally, I see daddy across the visiting room. His laugh is like fireworks, a loud, colorful boom. I run and jump into his arms and he hugs me tight. Good to see you, my little light bug, always so pretty and bright. As we take in this story, we're invited and reminded that one in 12 children in the United States have a parent who's experiencing incarceration. We offer that this morning we don't have a formal program for our religious education for our children and youth. Children and youth are welcome to remain in the service, but you're also welcome to leave um, at this point as we turn to our offering, our candle lighting, and our reflection. And now, a turn to our offering. When I think of the church, when I think of our collective congregations, um, our individual congregations coming back to the building after I was away for so much of the summer. I hold in wonder yet again how much all that we have, all that we enjoy, and all that we look forward to, so much of it comes because we ourselves are creating and making and giving. It is no less than with our financial gifts as well. Because we, the members and friends and the visitors of this congregation, we are the body that financially supports all the work that we do. And we cherish all that we've received in terms of the legacy that lives even as we just step into this building. And we prepare ourselves to make this space ready for those who will come after us, those we will never, ever meet. In that spirit, in that commitment, we take this moment of giving during the during the service as a sacred act to recognize the value of it in our lives, that this is a practice like any other spiritual practice that we get to hold and cherish and be intentional about and say, yes, this is what I can offer of my life in this moment. And now we will have the offering plates pass during our music for meditation. And once the plates have passed, I will light the candles and that will be the time for us to share the lighting of candles in meditation together. So let the plates come forward.
but give thanks for all that is given, all that is offered, all that is received. And in this moment, this is the sharing of joys and sorrows and the chance for meditation in our congregation. Ours is a spiritual community where we find and forge connections. We trust in the strength of our mutual support that our circle, grow, circle grows ever wider because each and every one is part of it. And it has sustained us again and again, day after day, year after year. So I want to begin with uh, joys. First, I'll offer uh, congratulations uh, to my spouse, as it is, Reverend Patrick Price. Uh, he is starting an interim ministry this week, a transitional ministry, with the UU Congregation of Quad Cities in Davenport, Iowa. Uh, he is, in fact, up there right this moment, probably leading worship right now. Patrick will be commuting to Davenport uh, and also working from home. It'll be a combined uh, venture for a three-quarter time ministry for this year. Also another joy uh, that Mary Mahalan Kafar uh, was able to visit her lovely spouse, Marsha, uh, this week in person, which is no small thing. Uh, but we also have to add a sorrow that Marsha is struggling with bronchitis and thank goodness that uh, Marsha was feeling well enough to answer the phone for Mary this morning. We also want to keep in our minds and hearts, in our circle of care, those who are incarcerated in all the ways that people are incarcerated in the state of Illinois, um, that we need to keep remembering and bringing into our heart the people that we cannot see and that are, no, are not able to be out and about in their way of moving freely. We want to offer uh, wishes for a speedy recovery to Connie Voss as she recovers at home from surgery. Um, and I want to offer a couple of notes of sorrow. First, for Connie, uh, Connie Voss and her family as they mourn the loss of Connie's father-in-law, Jean Voss. Uh, he was 90 years old, uh, lived in Peoria, and he passed on July 23rd. And we also offer a note of sorrow uh, and sympathy to Anne Comiskey. Her cat, Nigel, passed away yesterday. So this is a fresh loss. We offer our sympathy to Anne. Now I want to turn to our larger world. We offer our care and sympathy to the sick community. Um, August 5th, was the 10th anniversary of the deadly shooting at the Gurdwara in Oak Creek, Wisconsin. Six members of the Sikh community died that day, and another died later of his wounds. The attacker was a white supremacist who killed himself at the scene. Sikh teacher and guide Valerie Carr observed how the people came together to repair and clean the sacred space that had been so terribly violated and so ruined. For her, watching the elders, the people, the children of all ages, cleaning and caring for and repairing the space, making it, um, making it feel like it can be a place of gathering once again. It, it was for her invoking the sick spirit of Chardikala that ever-rising spirits, even in darkness. Ever-rising spirits, even in darkness. And she says, even in moments when hope is faint, it's a choice to orient to the present moment with the energies of love. She says, I believe Chardikala is the medicine we all need now. And so today, she says, inside my grief and rage at what had happened, I ask you to spread the message of Chardikala with me. So I want to offer that for our reflection as we gather and breathe together. Let us take up this charge in this spirit, knowing that we are so gathered and so intertwined in our relationships. As Lynn Cox reminds us, we are not alone in history. We are with us can be the courage of our living tradition, that we are not alone in entering the future, and that we need anchoring with presence and perseverance 
whether that is our own perseverance and spiritual grounding, whether that's part of our interdependent web of all existence, that spirit of life that some people call God. May we be reminded that we are not alone in times of grief and pain, that the spirit that is around us and among us comfort, comforts us, makes manifest that comfort in human hands and voices, and sometimes in the voices of our animal friends, those who comfort us in all ways as well. Remind us that we are not alone in joy and wonder, Let us be inspired to honor and extend the beauty we find in this world, the divine music of the universe, and let our hearts beat in diverse and harmonious rhythms, cooperating in an everlasting dance of love, a dance of many forms and many bodies. May we move in the rhythms of peace. May we move in the rhythms of compassion. May we move in the spirit of justice source of star and planets and water and land that is all around us, let our hearts be open to all of our neighbors, open our souls to the renewal of faith, open our hearts to join together in the work ahead. So may we be so opened in the ever-widening circle of life. So may it be. Amen. Let us hold one more moment and breathe and reflect together. Enter into the quiet with me. Amen. Please rise in body or spirit and join us for our hymn number 1053 from Libby Roderick, How Could Anyone? I share with you a poem this Sunday from my friend Lonnie Smith. He has been incarcerated at Stateville Prison for over 30 years. He is my pen pal and my friend. It's entitled Ghost. With all these years in prison, I believe I've come to feel what a ghost feels, forced to be spectators in a world where we've been long forgotten, neither here nor there, 
as life goes on around us. Some have forgotten that they were ever a part of that world. They go around hating the world and the people in it. Others remember too well. They long to be of that world again, to be seen, to be heard, to be relevant. Every once in a while, for however brief it may be, someone sees them, really sees them. Not for what they're told to see, a ghost, but for what lies beneath. For those who haven't and do not want to forget, who still cherish and hang on to their humanity, it means the world to them. So yes, behind these four walls, I've most definitely come to feel what a ghost must feel. Your friendly ghost. These words came to me when I first began my ministry in January of 2020 as the director and minister of the Unitarian Universalist Prison Ministry of Illinois. I've always had a heart for justice, and when one of my colleagues said, you should, you should look at this job, I said, I've never done prison ministry. And he said, it's, it's not about having gone into prison. It's about having an understanding of the larger systems that are at play, systems that we need to disrupt because they are working far too well and solving very little when it comes to addressing a real sense of justice in this world. And so I began this position and read this poem and realized that I wanted to be in conversation with Lonnie. I began in January of 2020, and by March of 2020, things had shut down. And I knew that if I wanted to actually do my job well, I needed to be in relationship with people who had been directly impacted by the prison industrial complex and also to be in relationship with people who were actively incarcerated. And so I reached out to one of our pen pals through our program at the Unitarian Universalist Prison Ministry of Illinois, and I asked if I could get in touch with Lonnie. For a while, we exchanged emails between her sending emails to him, and we realized that I should just become a pen pal with Lonnie. So let me show you a picture of Lonnie. This is Lonnie, and he's got this radiant smile. And when Lonnie and I were communicating, we had so much in common to talk about a common theology that preached that no one was outside the circle of love. I sent him those words from the reverends Susan Frederick Gray and Erica Hewitt, and he agreed with them wholeheartedly. He, at the time, was in a program with North Park Seminary, earning his degree, his master's degree, and we had so much in common. And then we started talking about dinners that I liked to cook, food he liked to eat. And unfortunately, eventually, as we were able to communicate over email, soon we could have phone calls, but they're only 20 minutes at a time because Lonnie's in prison. Let me show you the next slide. This is a picture of the Panopticon at Stateville. It was condemned, I believe, around 2008. It was reopened to house people who had COVID. There is a dissonance between that smile and that human, my friend, and this place. I'll show you the next slide. This is a picture of Lonnie feeling the spirit preaching Uh, from a video screenshot that I did of him preaching to his class at North Park Seminary at Stateville. And he was preaching about putting on the armor of God. Now, as we sang in our centering hymn, how could anyone fail to notice you are anything less than whole and beautiful? Imagine how important it is every day to gird yourself in a place where no one sees your worth and dignity that the system itself is created solely to punish. Imagine if you had to move through the world identified by possibly the worst mistake you ever made. 
Imagine, if you will, that you never had a chance, one chance, let alone a second. I'll show you the next slide. This is a picture of me smiling. My face was hurting from the smiling so much at Stateville Prison at a graduation for our North, North Park Seminary when Lonnie received his master's degree in restorative arts and Christian ministry. And this program at the graduation, so many of the men who are graduating spoke about how important it was that they had been given this opportunity for education, the opportunity to reflect and do the inner reflection they needed, that they would take from this experience and share with all the other people who were at Stateville, that there was a way of cultivating inside their own sense of hope and purpose. And yet, and I'll show you the next picture, this is all we were able to take with us of Lonnie. The other folks who were joining me at the graduation were members of the Hinsdale Unitarian Congregation. And so Tracy, who is his pen pal who originally connected us, she brought back his robe and stole, his master's hood, his tassel, and his emblem. And that was all that was able to leave of Lonnie. And so after an experience that is called a commencement, one continues to wonder, commencing into what? And yet what I have found in my experience in communicating with people who are inside prison is that they have had the opportunity again and again to reflect on the harms they have done. And that the people that we communicate with in our prison ministry of Illinois have reflected deeply and share openly, and they do not take lightly the harms that they have done. And nor do we. We live in a culture that is inherently violent. And as Daniel Sarid in the book, Until We Reckon, reminds us that most people who have experienced violence, their idea of justice is that the violence will not happen to someone else again. And what I have found in the brief time that I have had the privilege and honor of doing this work and companioning people, Unitarian Universalists, and people who have been directly impacted by these systems, is that we have an opportunity to discover together and reimagine together what justice really means. The late white Unitarian minister A. Powell Davies wrote, here we are, all of us, all upon this planet, bound together in a common destiny, living our lives between the briefness of daylight and dark, kindred in this, each lighted by the same precarious flickering flame of life. How does it happen that we are not kindred in all things else? How strange and foolish are these walls of separation that divide us? And so when I'm left with that image of, Lonnie's cap and gown being the only thing that could leave, I continually ask, how strange and foolish are these walls of separation that divide us? And I also, I always like to remind ourselves of who we are as Unitarian Universalists, that there are those of us in the pews and in our kinship time or fellowship time and coffee hour who have been directly impacted by the prison system, who have had loved ones who have been in and out of jail or prison, who have experienced this firsthand themselves. And when I have been in different spaces, whether they be on Zoom or in person, I have had people follow up with me with a sigh of relief that someone was finally able to lift this up and hold them and their own experience. And so when I speak of us as Unitarian Universalists, please know that there are many among us who have been impacted, many among us who have been impacted by these systems and harmed by these systems. So in our work at the Unitarian Universalist Prison Ministry of Illinois, which we call UUPMI, because we love acronyms, don't we? We work to have a presence inside. We have programs at the Cook County Jail that hopefully will soon be starting up with all of the back and forth with COVID closing down and opening back up. Uh, we have a program on the men's side and the women's side of small group ministry 
much like what your small group ministry looks like when you gather in circles together. We also have a program at Logan Women's Prison, which hopefully when COVID numbers are feeling more manageable, we'll be able to go in and and facilitate a small group circle ministry there as well. And what we found since the beginning of this organization, which was before my time in around 2015-16, is as people wanted to have a presence in jails and prisons as Unitarian Universalists, it became very clear that there was a, a privilege and a power to be able to go in and then also to be able to go out. And that there was an opportunity for when we went out to engage in advocacy that was led and guided by the people who had had the experience or were currently incarcerated. And so we embed advocacy in everything that we do, including programs of education, just about these systems that are around us that sometimes are rendered invisible to those who have never been directly affected. We do education about what is the prison industrial complex? What does it mean to defund the police? What do all of these things mean so that we can have conversations instead of drawing lines in the sand? Explorations together so that we may come to understand that these systems around us may or may not actually serve the spirit of love in the world or what we might think of as justice. And most of that happens through relationship. So I have a couple pen pals, actually probably around four at this point. (laughs) The list keeps growing. And I invite you to consider that. I'll be here after to talk with you more if you're interested in having a pen pal, which like any other relationship could be one letter written a month or for some has grown in in ways that uh, people never thought possible. They go visit their pen pal. They work on clemency support packets for their pen pals. So the relationships unfold just as any relationships on the outside do. And we also have a small program called Solidarity Circles, where we invite Unitarian Universalists in a congregation to form a circle of companionship and solidarity for someone who's been recently released. And that person is called the leader because they themselves know what they need best. And so the leader and the supporting members, they journey together in also a small group ministry format, and their lives change as a result of these relationships and this kind of and level of proximity. It really is about relationship, understanding that we are divided by strange and foolish walls in so many different ways. But the lens that I bring and the work that we do, it has invited me to reshape my ideas about what beloved community is. One of our former Solidarity Circle leaders and an activist who's uh, quite, uh, quite prominent on several panels, her name is Monica Cosby, and she wrote in a book called The Long Term, to me, community means a shared responsibility and accountability, caring and connection. Community understands that the health, happiness, success, security, and stability of community is directly connected to that of the individuals within it. In a community, support is given where needed. Solidarity is lived, not just a word spoken. One of the things I love best about the work that I get to do is that I'm inviting people into work that is impactful. Have you ever had the the situation where you're in a book study and you're reading about all of the problems and ills of the world and you leave the place just feeling the heaviness and the powerlessness of it? Like there's nothing we can do. And then when I talk with people, they say, oh my God, your job must be so awful and tiring. And it's not. There's something beautiful about being in relationship with people who have this inner drive to keep hope at the forefront of their minds, to truly embrace the idea, not just as a concept, but an embodied understanding of one's own inherent worth and dignity when everything around them tells them that they are less than, that they are subhuman. It's inspiring. It's energizing. Also to be in spaces of advocacy, like with the Illinois Network for Pretrial Justice, that's continuing to defend the wins of ending wealth-based incarceration in Illinois, 
people from all over the state who are doing amazing work in their own organizations who are truly embodying the spirit of love in the world and saying no to the strange and foolish walls that separate us. It's so awesome. So no, it is not a terrible, heavy job. And I want to invite you into this work because it is energizing as much as it is so awful to learn about all of the harms that go on in this world, to have to reckon with violence as a reality that has shaped the culture that we live in. Yes, all of that is heavy. And there are ways that we can come together to recognize that and still persist in hope and in love and in understanding our own inherent worth and dignity, as well as that interconnected web of life that calls us to abolish the walls that are strange and foolish around us. And so we, in our own Unitarian Universalist theology, are reminded constantly of the opportunities we have to reimagine the world we're living in and question all the systems that are around us and potentially decide to disrupt them. That we can engage in activities that have been going on for generations in communities that have never been served by the this, this justice system in transforming harm. Now, there's something called transformative justice. And transformative justice relies on a theology of beloved community. And it values that each individual has their own inherent worth and dignity, while also understanding that we are part of a circle of love that no one is outside of. That is truly radical, because there's some really nasty things that go on in this world, right? So what does it mean to truly say that no one is outside the circle of love? It doesn't mean that everyone has to say that someone's harm that they have done is okay. In fact, it's the opposite, that we call each other in and assume responsibility for the community that is around us. There's an organization whose mission is to end child sexual abuse. And they argue that we need to develop a liberatory approach to violence that's built on the principles of transformative justice, which include individual justice and collective liberation being equally important mutually supportive and fundamentally intertwined. The achievement of one is impossible without the achievement of the other. The conditions that allow violence to occur must be transformed in order to achieve justice in individual instances of violence. So transformative justice is a liberating politics and an approach for securing what justice is, right? So it's asking those questions of, why did this violence happen in the first place? What's going on in this system, in this community? How can we empower ourselves to make it so that this doesn't happen again? And they also say that the state and systemic responses to violence, including the criminal punishment system and child welfare agencies, often fail to advance individual and collective liberation and also condone and perpetuate cycles of violence. So we are being invited into a new sense of collective imagining. And we went to our Unitarian Universalist Ministers Association gathering, and I had the opportunity to attend on Zoom. And the keynote speaker was our colleague, the Reverend Alicia Ford. And I just want to share the next image that she shared with us with an invitation from Bell Hooks of an invitation to a love ethic in which we value loyalty and commitment to sustained bonds with the people, with plants, with beings over material advancement. So that there's a love ethic that centers this understanding that we are all connected and that has us concerned about these smaller circles that we in, but also widens that circle of concern. Understanding that we are at this turning point in our culture, in the United States and in the world, where we could envision that there's a dying empire and that something new is being born out of this ethic of love. Next slide. And so Alicia, the Reverend Alicia, invites us to divest ourselves of the notion that any part of this empire should be saved, that we insist on abolition, 
reparations, land back, welfare for all beings. Now, all of this may sound absolutely radical. And yet, at the same time, part of what I love about the work that I'm involved with is that it's about highlighting the work that is already happening that does just this. Communities of care where people are healing relationships and healing these large circles of communities where it's already happening. This list that looks so overwhelming and scary is already happening. And the privilege is to find those places and invest in them and encourage them. These are the spaces that live into the love ethic that tells us that no one is outside the circle of love. Thank you for that slide. And so we're reminded from Gwendolyn Brooks, writing in the poem Paul Robeson, we are each other's harvest. We are each other's business. We are each other's magnitude and bond. So I invite you to remember and repeat with me, no one is outside the circle of love. And what that circle invites us into, of how we want to be in relationship, not only with ourselves and our congregations, and in our smaller circles of family and friends, but also widening that circle of concern out to what the love ethic calls us to, which is this beautiful enlivening of our own humanity and our own inherent worth and dignity and understanding that we truly are interconnected and that when we begin to address and go forth with love into those spaces, then all that we imagined can become real. No one is outside the circle of love. Blessed be. Amen. Dear ones, we are invited to sing out our persistence and hope as we live into this deeper love ethic, as we question and struggle with it. The way may be difficult. It will be hard. We know. So please rise and body your spirit and join in singing Wo Ya Ya.
We extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts until we are together again. Little change, the words that we're closing with will be mine, not Albert Einstein's. I invite you to take a moment and imagine yourself within the circle of love. May we feel held in this circle as we go forth. May the spirit of love may move in and through us in all the ways we are in the world. And may we go forth seeking relationship, understanding that we are beautiful and whole. And we are so much more than our mistakes. Blessed be. Amen.